Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. There's a verse in Isaiah 40. It says this. It says, the grass will die and the flowers will fade, but the words of the Lord will live on forever and ever and ever. And listen, there is no more important thing you can be doing right now than not filling your mind with the junk and the bad news out there and filling your mind instead with the truth of the word of God. Memorize it. Because once it's in there, it will come out. I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've been up here speaking and I'm sharing a message and I'll come out with a verse that I'm like, whoa, I haven't thought of that one in a while. But it was in there because my dad forced me to memorize it when I was a kid. There's no greater thing you can do for yourself or for your kids. You know, my wife's always like, oh, she's getting behind in math or reading. I'm like, who cares as long as she's memorizing the Bible, right? (laughs) There's no greater thing you can do. Please do learn math and English, okay? But memorize the word of God because it's powerful. In Thessalonians, it says the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide in truth. And we're in this world right now. We're like, what is true? What is not? Man, when you know the truth deep within you because you've hidden God's word in your heart, you are set free for one. Yeah, but you have the confidence. You go, yeah, that's just not quite right over there because I know deep within me this truth that has set me free. So that's, let's close in prayer. I'm just kidding. That's not my message. But (laughs) I just want to encourage you, man, get the word of God in your heart. There's nothing better that you can do right now than stop filling your mind with the junk and fill it with truth and life and hope. Amen Amen to that? All right. We're going to continue our series this morning on the life of Caleb called A Different Spirit. Caleb and Joshua were uh, two of the guys that went into the promised land. We, re- we looked last week at the life of, of courage, the, the different spirit of courage, how we live in a world filled with fear. And if you're courageous, it will set you apart. And today we're going to talk about something a little bit different than courage. It's a little awkward to talk about it. We are going to talk about humility. In fact, the, the title of today's message is this, How to Be Humble. Now, I want every one of you to... Oh, that shouldn't be up there like that. Anyway, it's always awkward talking about humility because it's like, are you even supposed to talk about how humble, like how you've gotten humble? Oh, wait, as soon as you say you've gotten humble, you lose it, right? I have a friend of mine. He's like, yeah, they gave me this beautiful award. This is the most humble. He's like, but as soon as I wore it, they took it away. It's Humble is an, humility is an awkward thing. And I think there's a lot of misperceptions in our world today about what humility is. A lot of people, humility is just, humility is just do what the people in charge say and be obedient and compliant because that's what good little boys and girls do. And that's who Jesus likes after all. It's good, quiet, little, compliant boys and girls. And that is not humility. Humility, in fact, for the, for the purposes of definition, for the rest of this message, when you, when you hear me say humility, I want you to think of it in terms of this. Humility is an accurate perspective on reality. Because what is real is what is true. What is true is what is real. And we live in kind of a hyper-reality right now, if you haven't noticed it. People are saying, the sky is red. And you're like, I could swear that thing is blue. (laughs) No, it's red. In my mind, it's red. So it's red. And we're like, but it's blue. So where does humility fit into all this? So I'm going to tell a story this morning. And then we're going to talk, I hope, hopefully, from a new angle that you've never heard before on humility. About this time last year, um, I was uh, kind of getting a little bit bored, to be honest. Um, things were going quite well, and I was like, man, I should be content with where I am, but I'm really kind of bored with, with how things are going. Um, and so I was like, Lord, I'm just, so, I'm just so bored. I want something to do. And, and my wife, Emily, she's like, why do, you, like, why do you always have to make things hard? Just enjoy life. I'm like, but I need something, right? So I, I decided I'm going to take a PhD and get a PhD. Uh, to have a master's degree, I was going to go get a PhD, a doctorate, right? So I started taking this doctorate and man, like two months in, or two, two months, that's not true, two days in, I was like, forget this, I'm out. Like they, they had me write this thing in there and, and, and I had to write in 500 words what steward leadership was. And so I wrote the whole thing. I came out with like 380 words. I went to hit send and it said, we're sorry, you have to submit 500 words. And I'm like, but I said what I need to say in 360 or 80. 
So I went to hit send again. It's like, no, you must write 500 words. So it spent, took like another hour figuring out an extra 500 words to say. And then I started listening to this guy just drone on and on and all. He's like reading from a paper. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is torture. This is not worth it. So I dropped the PhD program. I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do? I need something to challenge me. Some of you are like, what is your problem? Like, life was way too easy for you, buddy. Well, come January, my dad and I decided we we're going to start a retreat center. So we bought 16 acres of land in Kerrville. And I, always, I noticed on, the, on the, the realtor.com thing, it says, this is undeveloped land. And I'm like, well, that's cool. I'll develop it, right? How hard could it be? <laughs> and it's in Kerrville. So it's got all these hills on it. Now, the problem in Kerrville is these hills, they're made of rock. So we get into it and they're like, well, man, in fact, on their friend Casey came out. He's one of the guys here and he does land development. He came out and he, he looked, and he's like, wow, this is some beautiful land. You ever done anything like this before? I was like, nah, but how hard could it be? And Casey's like, man, bless you, brother. You know, <laughs> he didn't really do that, but, <laughs> but he was super gracious. But I, could, but I could tell, I was like, wow, he thinks we're in over our heads. And sure, the more I got into it, I'm like, holy cow, what am I doing? Because person after person would come in and they'd be like, whoa, you ever done anything like this before? I'm like, uh, no. I'm like, you know, like plumbing needs to go in the ground. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you know, that's solid rock, like 10 feet of it. I'm like, oh yeah. How do you get through solid rock? Where are you going to need this giant machine that costs a lot of money? And I'm like, oh, and then I started getting these bills that had a lot of zeros after them. I'm like, whoa, that's, that's more zeros than I'm familiar with. So we're getting in deeper and deeper and deeper. And I went from being bored to going, God, save me. What have I done? If I'd have known now what I knew getting into it, I never would have taken on this project because it has literally overwhelmed me. And it got to the point where literally I was, I mean, Emily was like, I'm really worried for you, for your mental health, for your physical safety. And I was, I started to feel so overwhelmed. I started dreading this property project. And then little by little, the Lord started sending me people. One of the guys he sent me was Bill Wilcox, right back there in the sound booth. And man, Bill came along and he has helped me. I mean, this thing would not have happened without Bill coming in and helping me. I mean, he saved my mental health. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> but he came in, he started teaching me stuff. And he's like, yeah, that doesn't quite work that way. And it was just this super humbling experience because I was like, Wow, I wanted a hard thing and I got a hard thing. I, have, I, I'm, I feel like I'm getting a PhD in building. <laughs> I'm having to learn how to do plumbing and electric and the septic stuff. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Like you have to do this and these clean. And I was like, what in the world? So here, here's my point with it. This has been an interesting year because the year started out with me feeling totally bored with life. And now I'm at the place where I feel totally overwhelmed with life. And I'm guessing that every one of you at some point can relate to that. And I'm guessing every one of you right now is somewhere in this room. You're somewhere on this spectrum. Some of you are just bored. You've had some success. I see this a lot with men I work with in coaching in their 50s, maybe early 60s. They've had some success. They got some money in the bank. Things are going good. The business is cranking. They've got the house paid off. And now they're just kind of like sitting on their laurels, right? And they're, and, and they're honestly kind of bored. And, and, and in some ways, this is a very dangerous place for guys to be because this is when you start getting in trouble. Because men are made to conquer things and you start looking for stuff to conquer. And, and, and another woman is, that's not your wife is not something you should be conquering. I'm not kidding. This is where people get in trouble when they get bored and they're like, life is just so boring. And here's what really happens is you start to get a little bit arrogant because you look around and people are like, what's wrong with them? Like, why are they doing that? Because you've got some knowledge and some, some experience. And, and here's what I've heard about knowledge is, is it's, once you've got knowledge, it's, it's hard to remember what it was like to not have that knowledge. I've heard it said this way, the, the curse of knowledge must be constantly compensated for continually. When you know something, you forget what it's like to not know it. And you become a little judgmental of the people that don't know it. Well, they should know that, but they don't. And you know it and you could teach them, but instead you're just kind of like, oh, I'm so bored with life. Life is so easy. Some of you are like, that's a thing. You can feel that way because I know a lot of you are right over here. You're just overwhelmed. I've prayed with some of you this morning that you're there. You're like, I'm just, I would rather just end it all right now, but I've got four or five, six kids that I know are depending on me, family members. I can't do it. 
you're just overwhelmed. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're saying, I can't do this anymore. I can't do the stress of COVID. I can't do the stress of these finances. I can't do the stress of being alone anymore. I cannot take it. I'm so done. I've got, I'm constantly having to keep these plates spinning and then one falls over here and it takes me cleaning up. And while I'm cleaning that one up, this plate falls and breaks over here and everything's falling apart. I know that everybody in here fits somewhere in there. So figure out where you're at this morning. Because I'm going to, my premise this morning is that the answer to all of this is humility. You go, what? What? How, How is that possible? So we've been looking at the story of Caleb, right? Caleb, he was one of the spies that was sent by the children of Israel in to go check out the promised land. He and Joshua came back and they said, this is a good land. Let's take it. We looked at this last week, but because Caleb and Joshua were surrounded by a bunch of turkeys cowards, chickens, whatever you want to call them, they were forced to wander in the desert for 40 years and not achieve the promise that God had given them. Well, 40 years goes by and Caleb, the children of Israel are now in the promised land and Caleb goes, I'm still around. And he goes and approaches Joshua, who is now in charge of Israel. And this is where we pick up the story this morning. Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, said to Joshua, that's him, Joshua, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. Now, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. You remember this, Joshua. We did this together, right? And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers, the turkeys, who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. We talked about this last week. Courage is contagious, but fear is even more contagious. He said, all these people around me spreading fear. And so consequently, yet I wholly followed the Lord, my God. And he says this, and now, behold, I'm still alive. And I want my promise. The Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, for 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now you're going to read this next line and go, wait, I thought we were talking about humility. Here's what he says. And now, behold, I'm 85. Get that in your head. The dude's 85. Like that's 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. You ever been around a delusional old guy? I could still take them. I don't think so, buddy. But he's saying that. And you're like, whoa, aren't we talking about humility? My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now, give me my land. Give me the hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim, that was the superhuman giants that were dwelling in the land, with great fortified cities, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out just as the Lord has said. Now, this is funny because you're like, can you imagine an 85-year-old guy going, I'm just as strong now as when I was 40. Like, I'm 40s now, and I'm thinking, I'm half the man I used to be when I was 20. But this guy's got some crazy confidence. You're like, what is that confidence? And you know, they say it ain't bragging if you can back it up. Maybe that's what it was. Because he indeed does go and take the promised land. And it wasn't too late for him. But I think he did it out of humility. And, and, and the, the tip of the, that we see with the two things he said that tipped me off to the humility in his heart, even though he made some pretty bold statements, is this. Remember when he was 40 years earlier, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephna, they were among the nations who had spied out the land. They tore their clothes whenever all the chickens were saying, we can't do it, we can't do it. He said, listen, the land we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And listen, this is the humility. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. But don't rebel against the Lord. And don't fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. The people were so disturbed by Caleb's confidence that they're like, we need to kill that dude because he's making us look bad. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's just, I'm so glad we moved beyond that. But anyway, you know, in our world today, nobody, nobody looks that. But Here's what I think is fascinating about this, okay? 
you look at Caleb and you go, that seems like arrogance. But seeing that humility is a proper perspective on reality, this is really important to understand. I think the key word in what he said that triggers us to see that there was a deep humility with him is this. If the Lord delights in us. My translation of if the Lord delights in us is this. This is Joel's translation. I don't know what's going to happen if I do this. I don't know what the future holds. But I'll put myself in a vulnerable spot, be courageous, and I'll trust him. Now, I have not met a single person that likes this word, especially men. When you ever had your wife go, would you just be vulnerable with me? Or like, don't use that word, sweetheart. <laughs> I hate this word. Vulnerable, not a cool word. You know, we've all had those dreams. Or you ever had that dream where you're like naked in front of a crowd of people? <laughs> that's vulnerable. Like, that's what it feels like to be vulnerable. And you wake up and you're like, oh, thank God it was just a dream. <laughs> Nobody likes to be vulnerable. But I believe that humility comes from a place of recognizing that, you know what? You are vulnerable. And apart from God protecting you and defending you and caring for you, you're vulnerable. And that's the reality of situations. And you know what? As much as you know, there's way more to know. In fact, what you don't know is way more important than what you do know. Because what you don't know can kill you. And one of the dangers of our wonderful, amazing, advanced, developed world is we know a lot of stuff. Like the whole world of information is in the palm of your hand. Right there. Anything you need to know. Right there. And yet we're watching TikTok all day. Anyway. It's all right there. We have tons of knowledge. And the, the scary thing about when you get some knowledge is you start to get a little bit cocky. Oh, we can fix that. We can stop anything. I heard a guy the other day saying, we've got to figure out how to stop hurricanes. I was like, good luck with that, bro. <laughs> That'd be impressive. We start to think, man, we can cure and solve anything. I'm going to tell a story, okay? A year ago, my daughter got some really bad hives really bad all over her body. And we called her doctor, great lady. We called the doctor and we said, what do we do? And she said, you give her Benadryl and Zyrtec. So we started giving her Benadryl and Zyrtec every six hours. The hives are getting worse. So I call the next day. I'm like, hey, um, wh what do we do? Like, it's not getting better. She's like, oh, you know, just give it some time. The cure is Benadryl and Zyrtec. I'm like, it doesn't seem to be working. And we're up all night trying to keep Elise, you know, from, from itching. And she's like, dad, I'm so itchy. Uh. This goes on for five days. Every day I'm calling the doctor and she's like, are you giving her Benadryl and Zyrtec? I'm like, yes, I'm giving her Benadryl and Zyrtec. <laughs> Finally, the fifth day, I'm like, lady, doctor, I need you to check this out. This is something is off here. She's like, all right, bring her in, bring her in. And this is when the height of COVID, so they're like, wait in your car and then we'll put a full hazmat suit on you and you can, I'm like, whatever. On the way to the, the doctor, I call my sister and she's like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, Elise has hives. And she's like, oh, come by the house. I got something for that. I'm like, oh, what is it? So we pull up at the house. My sister walks out with a little Ziploc baggie with some dried green leaves. And uh, she walks out and she gives them to me. She's like, put this in this little applesauce. And I'm like, what is this? She's like, just, just don't worry about it. So we put it in there and I stir it up and I give it to Elise. In the 10 minute drive from my sister's house to the doctor's office, the hives disappear. There's a couple little marks left. And we get to the doctor and the doctor lifts off Elise's shirt and she's like, oh, it's working. I'm like, no, no. And she's like, well, the hives are gone. I was like, yeah, well, that's because I just gave her these, these, uh, these dried leaves my sister gave me. And she's like, and I had a video camera on because I wanted to, Emily, Emily wasn't there. She was actually flying that day. I wanted a video of her saying some suggestions on what we could do to make him go away. And the, the doc, I have this video of this doctor rebuking me. She's like, don't be giving that stuff to your kid. We don't know what's in that. That is not FDA approved. Do you even know what it was? I'm like, it worked. <laughs> and she just rebukes me and rebukes me. And she's like, blah, blah, blah. And we doctors this and that. And we know. And I'm like, lady, God bless you. But something that works that I don't understand to me is far superior to something I completely understand that is not working. So we walked out and I was like, thank you, thank you. But I just got so frustrated because I thought, you know, isn't that exemplary of our world today? We know so much 
and we have so much confidence. And God, thank God for medical science. Man, thank God for Benadryl and Zyrtec. I use them both. But you know what? There's so many things out there that God has placed out there that we don't even know about that can cure things that we don't even know we need cures for yet. And so what we need is a little bit of humility and the willingness to say, I just don't know. But nobody likes that. And we fear that if we say we don't know, we'll look vulnerable. So we have a lot of people running around. In fact, I had a guy tell me this. He said, he was a doctor. And he said, the weirdest thing is, if you're really a doctor and a scientist, he said, it's humbling. You're always hoping to be proved wrong. He's like, but we've started to wield science as a sword. This is the truth. Surrender to science. And I ask this, science now or science 15 years from now? I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, well, science 15 years from now is going to be very different. Oh, so which science now? Well, I guess science now. Then I say, so then what you're actually saying is surrender to the limits of our current knowledge. Nobody likes hearing that. But I mean, that's the reality of it. Education, guys, I'm all for it. I have a master's degree in counseling. But education by intent it basically creates a, a body of knowledge and they say, this is what everybody needs to know. But here's the thing, to graduate, right? But you know what they call graduation? It's called a commencement ceremony. So you go to high school, and you remember this when you were in high school, you're like, "Woo, I got a high school diploma. And then you went out to get a job and everybody's like, you got any experience? You're like, no. Well, you go get some experience and we'll hire you. Well, how do I get experience? I don't know. Better find someone to give you experience. Well, how do I get experience? Well, you got to have be qualified. How do I get qualified? Through experience. <laughs> and you're like, but I have a paper. And they're like, yeah, but it was the commencement. Now you get to see what life is really about. But we've created this illusion that once you've got the paper, you really know a bunch of stuff about stuff. <laughs> and you don't. As somebody who apparently knows a bunch of stuff about stuff, I am constantly humbled by how much I don't no, in so many domains of the world. And listen, this is my point. Let's have a little bit of humility, y'all. And it's so scary because humility admits we don't know. We are vulnerable to forces that are beyond our control. All right, y'all with me? Because I'm about to say something. Some people are going to go, hey, hey, hey. All right. When I was deciding whether to get the vaccine, right, I started doing a bunch of research. Which one should I get? Should I get it? You know, and there's, and there's so much stuff out there. And I, I came across this one article and it spoke to me so much because it's this university and they said, you know, they started asking about the vaccine. I see everybody getting nervous. Calm down. It's going to be okay. Um, <laughs> and they, one of the things they said is, they said, you know, well, is the vaccine safe? And they said, we don't know, but we think it is up to this point, but here are some, some concerns. Will it cause long-term? We don't know. But did, and I was like, Thank God for a little humility. Thank God. Like, we don't know. It's just too early to tell. And when you have anybody boldly declaring, we know, we know, I'm like, how? How do you know? And, and there's no way you can possibly know because there are 10 million variables out there that you don't know about. And in your arrogance, if you think you know, I'm scared for me and for you, especially because you're making the rules. Humility. In fact, I would, I would say sin in many cases, certainty in many cases is a sin because God is saying, you don't know what I'm capable of. You don't know what I've put in the world. Now, that can be scary because for those of us who like to control everything, we're like, must know more information. And God's like, you're never going to know all the information. You're never going to be able to control everything in your life. You know, you thought you had the parenting thing down and then that one kid came along. You know what that's like. You're like, oh my gosh, I thought I had this nailed. And then the kid, you're like, this kid is like nothing I've ever seen before. <laughs> well, here's the good news. Here is the good news. Humility is actually the road to success. The longer I walk with the Lord, the more I'm convinced that if you want success in your parenting, in your leadership, in your business, in your ministry, in your personal life, in your relational life, humility, the idea that I don't know, I don't have the corner on knowledge, and I'm not always right, and I'll admit it, is the key to success. And here's the beautiful thing when you, when you surrender and recognize, I just don't know. Not, but I'm
Maybe you need to take on something that's way bigger than anything you can do so you'll feel a little humbled. And maybe you need to learn something new that makes you feel dumb and foolish. If you want to improve, Epictetus said this, I think he was, one of the Stoics. He said, if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. Anytime you're starting something new, learning a language. I, we, <laughs> it was so funny. We used to bring people down to Guatemala and they would study Spanish. And some of the things they would say were so embarrassing. We had a guy one time, he was learning Spanish. He's like, I want to, I want to say my greeting in Spanish. We're like, you sure you don't want us to translate it for you? He's like, no, no, no. And he's like... Quiero agradecer, agradecer a todos los adulteros aquí. He said, and he meant to say, I want to thank all the adults here. And he said, I want to thank all the adulterers here. <laughs> Adultereros instead of adultos. And all the people were like. <laughs> and afterwards I told him and he was so embarrassed, but I'm like, kudos to you for being a fool. That's what you got to do. You got you to look dumb when you start. So here's the thing. And now for those of you who are overwhelmed on this other side, and I know that's a lot of you in this room, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Lighten up. You aren't that important. <laughs> a lot of the things that you're trying to manipulate and control, maybe you just need to let that plate drop to the floor and take care of what's most important. Focus on your kids. Focus on your personal health. Focus on your spiritual walk. And I've found over and over again, when you get those priorities in line, you know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all those other things will be taken care of. He wasn't joking when he said that. If you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed this morning, maybe you do need to let some plates drop to the floor. And maybe when they start to drop, you'll actually find Jesus will be there to pick them up and go, I got this. You just need to chill. Because I got you. Stop trying to control all the outcomes. And let God be God in your life. You say, yeah, but well, if I don't do it, nobody will. Maybe, but have you tried surrendering? That's my encouragement for you this morning. If you're there and you're saying, man, I don't, I don't know what to do. The answer to everything is humility. If you don't know what to do because you're bored, if you don't know what to do because you're overwhelmed, drop to your knees and say, God, you are God. I am not. You are the most important one in the universe. I'm not, but I'm grateful that you love me. So I'm going to start from there. Just humble yourself before him. Let go of trying to control and dominate and manipulate. Let go of your need to always look like you're in control and right. I've always, I'm always right. He's, in, he's in large and in charge. He knows what's going on. Let go of that. Humble yourself before the Lord because that's how you get actual glory. And you've all been around somebody that's like, they're like talking about how great they are and you're like, you're not really that great. But when the Lord lifts somebody up and you see people are like, how'd they get there? And they say, man, it was all God. That can be where you find yourself if you'll humble yourself before the Lord because the, end, the ultimate end of humility is not walking around feeling bad about yourself. The ultimate end of humility is total confidence it's glory. It's realizing, man, God is in control of my life. He hasn't forgotten me. He loves me dearly. And he literally is in control. And I'm going to do what I can do. I say, I say, work as if it depends on you and pray as if it depends on God because both are true. I'm going to do my best with what's in front of me and I'm not going to, I'm going to see what's in my control and control that. But what's out of my control, I'm not going to control it because I can't and it'll just make me anxious. Take a deep breath, humble yourself before the Lord, and I guarantee you this, in due time, he will take you places you never dreamed, exceedingly, abundantly, far above all we could ever ask or think. This is what God has in store for those who love him. The path of the righteous like the light of dawn shines brighter and brighter to the fullness of day, but it starts with humbling yourself before the Lord and getting a really clear picture of what humility, of what reality is. When you do that, man, God can take you places you never dreamed. You receive that? Let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.